I think we can start. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, I can. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Investia Africa Financial Modeling Webinar. Uh, my name is Joyce Kamara. I work at Investia Africa. Uh, today we have two guests of our own and uh, I'll give them a chance to speak about themselves and what they do at uh, Investia. But before then, I'd like to give you a little information about Investia if this is your first time here. We are a corporate project and advisory firm and our segments range from uh, financial model audit, due diligence, capital raising, and financial modeling training. And this is where the competition was born. Um, why we decided to do the competition is because we wanted to have a pool of talent in the financial space and also help students to develop this skill. Um, we have had, uh, we have been running for the last four years. This is our fifth year. Uh, and we have been able to visit about 12 universities so far based in Nairobi. And we have trained about uh, 2000 students and uh, uh, the number is increasing. We had a few students from Mombasa participating last year. Uh, although we were not able to train in their universities specifically, but this year I know we'll be able to reach more people because everything is being done online and we hope to be Africa-wide. Um, so some, some of the previous uh, partners we've had are like uh, Consonance, ECV, Credev, Open Oil, and the like. And we also we had Duma for, to help with soft skills. Uh, this year, we have, a, we have a, the first standard who have been supporting us since the time we began, um, F1, F9, EACV, EAVCA, and also ACON have uh, joined, and they will be giving an um, internship to the top students, so I encourage most of the students to participate in this competition. So on your screen, you can see some of the universities that we have visited. Um, I know some of you are represented here. Uh, last year, we were able to train at Osho College, and we hope that uh, this time we'll have even more students participating. Uh, those are photos of some of the students we've uh, trained, and also some of the trainers. And without further much ado, I'd like to welcome Steve and Kezia to introduce themselves and uh, say what they do at Investia. Kezia? Thank you so much, Joyce, and my apologies for being late. Uh, my internet and my computer just had problems, but my apologies for that. My name is Kezia and Jerry. I work with uh, Investia Africa as a senior associate, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, uh, Kezia. Uh, my name is Steve Ogada. I'm a co-principal at uh, Investia Africa, and I look forward to this session. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, as we go on, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions on our chat and we'll be able to answer them uh, once we finish. So the first question I'll ask to I'll ask is here, what is the difference between uh, in financial modeling and uh, corporate finance and project finance? All right. Uh Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, just to introduce our corporate finance and uh, project finance. So ideally, corporate finance relates to financing of corporations, and these are type of financing could either be debt or uh, equity investment, while uh, project finance relates to financing uh, infrastructure projects, such as uh, roads and railways and uh, public utilities. What I'd like to say at this point is that uh, most of the components that we'll discuss here um, would be common in both uh, corporate and project finance. But the difference is that uh, in project finance, you'd find uh, labels such as uh, historical and uh, forecast uh, periods. So historical periods will capture the historical data for the, for the company, while the forecast uh, period would capture the 
forecast period data. So to be able to forecast the, to be able to develop your forecast, you use the historical data to come up with uh, indicative uh, numbers that would help you to make the projections for the forecast period. And then this data would be reflected in the forecast period label. Then um, another difference is uh, ratios. So in a corporate uh, finance model, you'd find ratios and these ratios are used to assess and track the performance of a business. Some of these ratios would include uh, working capital ratios, they'd include uh, profitability ratios and uh, liquidity ratios. While you will have ratios in a project finance model, the ratios might be different and might uh, mostly focus on the leverage ratios because project finance models are highly geared. So that's that on the key ratios. Then the other thing you'd find in a corporate finance model is what you call the common size analysis. So the common size analysis helps you to identify the trends in the business. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, um, for a PNL, the common size would, uh, I would try to assess the performance of the various items against the revenue. So for example, if you're doing a common size on your marketing costs, against um, the revenue, you'd be trying to identify the proportion of your revenue that is being spent on marketing costs. So you do that for all your P&L items against the base item, which the, in this case, the base item would be your revenue. And then you do the same thing for the balance sheet and the base item for the balance sheet would be your total assets. So when you do this, then you'd be able to identify any major changes over the period as far as the company's performance is concerned. Then lastly, I'd like to highlight um, the valuation sheet. So the valuation sheet would capture the value of the business and mostly for M&A transactions. And um, valuation in this case could uh, be, I mean, you would use different approaches for a corporate finance model to value a business. And that could be the discounted cash flow method, the market approach or the net asset value approach. But remember for a project finance model, valuation would not uh, include uh, a market approach, for example, because the market approach is only applicable for corporate finance um, models. So then lastly, I'd like to also say that revenues for corporate finance models will be modeled based on the business model that the company has applied. And uh, these will definitely differ across uh, different uh, business models. But remember for a corporate finance that has a, so, so you have a company that you're doing, a, that you're building a project a model, I mean, sorry, that you're building a finance model for, and it has several revenue lines, you'd be able to build the revenue lines in the same model, but separately. For example, a juice company that might have juices and uh, water as some of their product items, you'd model the juice revenue separately and the water revenue separately, but in one financial model. While you compare this to a project finance model, for every project you'd have a special purpose vehicle for each and every project. So that's the difference between a corporate uh, finance model and I'll allow Stephen Ogada to speak about uh, the project finance models. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kezia. So yeah, just to add on to what uh, Kezia said, uh, you'd be thinking about, I mean, away from modeling, uh, think about project finance as uh, uh, fun funding for a specific project as opposed to corporate finance where uh, investors have access to cash flows for the overall company. Uh, project finance, you look at cash flows as an investor specific to the project and uh, what we talk about are items like non-recourse debt, where uh, the funding from, I mean, the cash flows from the project are the exclusive for uh, uh, servicing uh, the funding that uh, the project uh, has contracted. Now, from a financial modeling perspective, uh, you'd be looking at the structure of the financial model being different from that of uh, uh, that of uh, the corporate finance model in the sense that then you'd be looking at more often than not a project would be um, a greenfield. 
So there'll be the development phase, uh, there'll be the construction phase, and there'll be the operational phase. Additionally, uh, uh, I mean, Kezi has mentioned about ratios, and uh, there's a lot to do with the uh, debt service. And uh, in terms of capital structure, you find that uh, corporate, I mean, project finance uh, uh, requires quite a bit of leverage, and you'd be looking at uh, 70 party in terms of debt equity. So the model will be structured in a way that uh, you, you, you want to see that the cash flows are able to service that debt. So we'll have the have ratios like debt service coverage ratio. There'll be aspects of debt sculpting where you're saying that uh, as opposed to corporate finance, where example, for example, you'd be given, a bank will give you an, a loan amortization amortization schedule uh, for project finance, you'd be looking at sculpting the cash flows to be able to meet uh, debt service uh, so that uh, you're, still, you're still able to tick that box of uh, non records whereby uh, debt service that is due this month will be sorted out by cash flows from uh, the project this month without necessarily any external uh, cash flow. Additionally, uh, you'd be looking at, um, uh, you'd be spending a lot of time on the capital uh, structure inside of the funding side of the project to ensure that uh, uh, you're able to uh, cover uh, the project funding needs as and when uh, they occur. Over to you, Joyce. Okay, thank you so much both. Uh, Steve, still on you. I think, um, can, you, can you maybe give us some factors that contrib contribute to risk in, a financial, in financial modeling? Um, so I think the, the, first, the first thing is uh, time, uh, in that uh, the longer, the, longer the, the focus period, the higher the uncertainty, of course, then the higher the risk. Uh, so you want to focus for a very realistic period. Uh, say for corporate finance, you look at maybe five years. For project finance, uh, for example, if it is power, uh, you're looking at forecasting based on the, uh, the PPA term or the power purchase agreement term, which is 20 years, and likely uh, the, the payments would be fixed, save for escalation. Um, the, um, so time. Uh, the second thing is um, the inputs and the quality of the inputs uh, that uh, you put in the model uh, for the simple reason that in as much as um, uh, a financial model will churn out numbers, it really depends on what you, has been put into that model. Uh, the saying goes garbage in, garbage out. So if then the, the inputs or the assumptions are not, uh, don't stand the test of time, definitely that uh, contributes uh, to risk. And then the other thing that uh, would also contribute to risk is uh, calculations. If then uh, the calculations are not uh, robust or thorough, then definitely there'll be errors in the model and uh, that also is a key factor in terms of risk. Because uh, would you like to chime in? I think you've uh, captured the key risks. Uh, what I'll just add is uh, probably human error, mm -hmm. which may arise when you're probably keying in the data or when you're putting in the formulas, and that would be carried across the, the entire financial model. So I think uh, we, you have highlighted the rest of the risks that uh, would, be, would arise from building a financial model. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Kezia, would you tell us maybe um, the importance of standardization in modeling? All right, thank you so much, uh, Joyce. As far as uh, standardization is concerned, I'd say that the beauty of uh, using a standard in any, in any process is that, um, is that um, it helps you to build something that can be understood and, uh, and that is easy to, 
to, to, to interpret. So in this particular case in our organization at Investia, we use uh, what we call the first standard. And first here means a uh, flexible, appropriate, structured and transparent. And what these uh, enables us to do is to build models that can easily be, if you need to make any changes, you can easily go into the assumption sheet and make the changes. And the inputs have been labeled in a specific way. You'd know these are inputs. And if there are if there are any, if there is any data that is coming from a different sheet, it's marked in a certain color. In this case, which is blue, and when you see the blue, you already know it's coming from a from a new sheet. So what this means is that um, if you're reviewing the model, or if you're the end user of the model, you're able to follow what has been done. And in our case, we do not. Um, we always ensure that the the formula you have at the beginning of the cell is the formula you have at the end of that cell on that row. So this, en this ensures that you don't have inputs in the middle of the, um, of the row, which could cause confusion when you're making changes. So the, the, what I'd say in summary is that the beauty of using a standard is that it enables you to build a well-structured model that is easy to interpret even for the user and for any model auditor. Um, so that's what I'd summarize uh, the, as the importance of using standardization in financial modeling. Okay, thank you so much. And as, as Kezia has said, we use the first standard. So I'd request uh, all of you to visit our online platform, learn.investia.com. You'll be able to see the introduction video to FAST. And also our competition will also be on the same platform. Hence, you need to visit and also do um, a bit of training. Um, Okada, I'll, I will shoot this question to you. Um, what is some of the best advice you can you keep going to when making a career or professional decision? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Joyce. Um, I think it's important to look at where your where your passion is because um, and I mean I, I know that is cliche but uh, financial modeling or the finance world is quite demanding uh, especially from a number crunching perspective so you i mean if you're not comfortable with numbers you better just walk away early than try to fit into that space so um, i think it matters what where your passion is where you feel comfortable and um, even if at this point in time, uh, say maybe you're just you're in your last semester or uh, you cleared the campus, uh, the, uh, you're still not clear in terms of which direction you want to take. Uh, give it a try. Uh, may or may not work out. Uh, uh, the finance world is interesting because every day you're learning something new and uh, it helps uh, when uh, you, I mean, you engage and uh, read quite a bit in terms of uh, what's happening in the finance world uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of products that are coming out uh, that would help you in terms of uh, getting to understand what's going on so i would say uh, passion what drives you where your skills are at uh, but then ne you never, I mean, the situation is never perfect. You always work to learn to, to better yourself. Like financial modeling requires a lot of practice. You have to put in the time. And uh, I think there are great opportunities in the finance space. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Kezia, same question as we also wait for more questions from our participants. All right, thank you so much, Joyce. i just echo what um, Steve has said in the sense that uh, for this particular context, which is uh, financial modeling, it's just a matter of uh, practice, practice makes perfect, as they, they'd say. I know it sounds cliche, but that's the reality. And uh, what I was going to say ties into what uh, Ogada has said, and it's over time, you, you learn things by observing people do those things or by reading about those things or by listening to people speak about how they do those things. But what I've realized is unless you do those things practically, you never really know whether you know how to do it and you'll never get good or better at it. 
So I just emphasize on the need to find learn as much as you can from other people, but also engage and apply yourself practically to be able to do the things you aspire to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, I seem not to be having any questions from uh, participants, or I think there is one here. Um, have used first in MA models and is financial modeling the right path to investment banking? Maybe OG, you can answer that. Uh, yes, we've used FAST in uh, M and A models, and uh, uh, I mean, definitely, financial modeling uh, helps. Uh, it brings a lot of value when you're getting into investment banking, for the simple reason that uh, for most um, transactions, there'll be a lot of valuation, there'll be forecasting, and uh, Financial model is a key tool. It's not the only thing you need to know in investment banking, but it's one of the things that can help you or can propel you in terms of excelling uh, in that field. Okay. Kiprono, I hope you have answered your question. And maybe Joyce, I can chime in here. Yes. Um, when we were introducing corporate finance, we mentioned that uh, corporate finance basically deals with uh, financing for businesses. And if you're talking about, uh, about mergers and acquisitions, then you're talking about an equity investment. So what this means is that you'd need to build a valuation model to determine what's the value of that business that you, that you intend to acquire. And um, it also helps when you build the financial model because then you know where the business is, where, where you expect the business to go in terms of its future revenues, future profits, and that is a big determinant. I mean, it's a big factor in determining whether the business is attractive for investment or not. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, maybe two last questions. Uh, Kezia, when you're in university, what did you want to do? And how different is it from what you're doing right now? So, when I was in, in university, I thought I'd work in an insurance company because I studied uh, actuarial science and back then it was new and we all, th we all thought that you have to work for an insurance company if you have an actuarial background. But um, right after school, I joined, uh, I joined um, a stock brokerage firm. So of course, I ventured into the investment space and uh, after that, I did a master's in finance and investment and then I found myself at Investia. So I'd say that it might not necessarily be the case that what you aspire to be in school is what you will be um, in the job market. But I think when you start working, you get to realize what, you, what your interests are and what your passions are, and you tend to pursue a certain career path which might be different from what you intended to pursue. Thank you, Joyce. Okay. Steve, did you go to university to do what you're doing right now? Well, the, the beauty about um, finance is that, I mean, even if you did medicine or pharmacy, you can still, I mean, even if you did agroforestry, uh, speaking to what Kezia is talking about, that, um, you know, university um, is a path, uh, university education is a path to grow, to, you don't necessarily have to apply what you've learned, uh, I mean, sorry, let me put it this way, that you don't necessarily have to pursue the same path as what you've studied. So personally, I studied economics, economics very related to finance. Uh, I thought I would end up maybe in public sector, in government, treasury, central bank, KRA, uh, but still, um, uh, economics is part of part and parcel of finance and uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in a good space. Okay, good to hear that. Uh, let me ask you, Ogada. Um, there's one book maybe that you read that has impacted you. What would that book be? So there are a number, but let me speak to what is relevant in this context as a, a university student. 
I will tell them to read the Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad. In <laughs> in terms of I see Kezi is laughing. In terms of just uh, looking at uh, having a long term view, not being uh, short sighted, uh, sacrificing uh, in terms of uh, just ensuring that uh, you're prudent in your spending. Uh, you're prudent uh, in terms of uh, your decision making and uh, looking at the bigger picture, uh, not looking at today only. I think uh, it's uh, at this level, and um, I, I guess there are participants that have read uh, maybe more advanced books, if I may say so. But at this level, I think that I, I, would, I think it would be relevant. Okay. Kenzie, for yourself? I've also read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the other one we read in school, we all read about the surgeon. What was he called? Um, anyway, there are certain books we all read during our time, but uh, for me, the one that has uh, recently changed my view of um, the workplace or how I interact with people is Quiet by Susan Cain. And the reason why I, I picked that book is because in the workplace, you have introverts and you have extroverts. And in the past, we've been made to think that extroverts are the most successful people. And what uh, uh, the book says is that even introverts can be successful because they have certain um, strong attributes that make them uh, suitable for certain roles. For example, introverts focus better, apparently, and they are also empathetic, which could position them for certain um, responsibilities in the organization. I'd also say that um, the fact that uh, the same researchers found that one in three people is likely to be an introvert means that we need to learn to, be, to work and live with introverts. And uh, lastly, what I'd say is that being an introvert does not mean you have to be less than remarkable. You can be remarkable in a quiet way. So what I'd encourage uh, any introvert listening to this is that uh, you can push yourself and you need to push yourself to be noticed, even though you're not as loud as some extroverts might be. Yeah, so that's about it for me. Mm, thank you so much. I have a question here from Robert. He, he says, I have just cleared procurement and logistics. How do I transition from it to finance? Maybe one so of you can. If I could take that. Huh? Um, as Steve mentioned, the thing with uh, finance is that there are just certain concepts that you need to understand. And if you understand those concepts, it becomes, I wouldn't say extremely easy, but it helps you to venture into the finance space because I'm sure you've heard of lawyers who then went ahead to become finance experts. You've heard of uh, people with a background, I don't know, in engineering that ended up in the finance space. So I'd say that you need to, of course, of course, you need the professional qualifications. You might start with, um, say, a degree or uh, a certification, I, maybe in like these CIFA certifications. And then that definitely gives you the paperwork to, to start having those, uh, to start looking for those opportunities. But as you do that, you can also try and put yourself in places that enable you to do certain tasks that relate to finance. It could be reviewing um, accounts for a company. If you also have the background, you could also assist in preparation of those accounts. And once you start reviewing and, and analyzing financial data, then you obtain certain skills that would help you to mature in that space. And of course, watch videos, um, have a mentor who's in that space to help you understand the things that you, I mean, the basic concepts in finance. And um, yeah, I think, uh, and then pursue the professional certifications, if at all. But definitely, as I mentioned earlier, you need to practice. So you can just read and expect to know, you need to read and practice what you have read. Okay, thank you so much, Kezia, for that. Um, everyone, this, this session will be recorded and we shall share it on our YouTube channel. So maybe you can refer to it. Um, and if there are no more questions, please remember to visit our online platform, learn.investia.com. Also follow us on our social media handles, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. We'll be giving more information. And also 
the webinars will be running for the next couple of weeks until we have the competition that is on 26th to 30th of October. So next Friday, same time, we'll have another guest. And uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you, all of you, for participating and uh, coming here. Have a blessed weekend and a lovely evening. Thank Goodbye. you so much, Joyce, and thank you. thank you to all the participants. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Kezia. Thank you to the participants. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Same to you. You too. Thank you.